Welcome to the Broken Pie Chart Podcast, episode 244. I had to think about it for a second. I'm your host, Derek Moore. With me once again is my semi-permanent co-host, Jay Pestercelli, CEO of Zega Financial. Jay, it's official. We're in a correction. Congratulations. Or I don't know why congratulations. Yeah, today, that, yeah, well, I'm glad to be here regardless of, of a correction or not. So as of here, Friday, the 27th, the market uh, has... The S and P, I should say, has dipped ten uh, percent uh, back, pulled ten percent back from its previous high. You know, like is there? Did you ever find it? Think it was kind of random that ten percent was the number? Why not nine point seven? Why not ten point three? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I will tell you the other side of it. Right between the correction, the next level is bear, which everybody says is twenty percent. The market does tend to find some footing before it gets to that 20% mark. I mean, we've seen it drop 19% of the time uh, at times and not break the 20. So uh, I, that one feel, feels a little more relevant. But yep, that minus 10 is, uh, that's the random number. So correction territory. In, in price. I don't I don't think it's worth it. In price. I mean, I guess we've had some dividends. By the way, the, the 20% you referenced or not getting the 20%, Remember December of 18, what was it, 19.8% down? And we said, no, no not a bear, right? Yep. Not a bear, wasn't 20. Not a bear. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. You know what I find to be a better kind of indicator of What's bearish or bullish is more like, are you above or below the 200-day moving average, right? Like that seems to be a little better indicator whether the market has kind of changed its disposition yet in my mind. And the S&P crossed that earlier this week. Don't know. I don't think the NASDAQ has yet crossed it. And the Russell's been below it forever, right? The rut is, uh, been, so I mean, I like that measurement, whether you're, you know, people are still optimistic or not. I like that as a better measurement than, uh, than the whole 10% thing, but just my preference. A lot of people also said, Hey, I mean, we, is this bull market over? I, I always sort of, there's two ways to look at bull and bear markets. There is, what do we call it? The cyclical bear bull market and just, you know, where where you sort of decide your starting point. The old high of 48.1862, which was back on January 3rd of 22. Like in my mind, until you make a higher high above that, it's not it's not a new cyclical bull market. Like if, if you bought on that day, you're still down money. So I know a lot of people say, well, we're in a bull market, but I don't know. I mean, over the long term, I guess that's how you look at it. But no doubt, I mean, we are still up off the lows. The low was what, 35.8307 in, was that October 10th of 22? So we're still above that, but you know, we're 10% off the highs, but we haven't exceeded the old high. I mean, do you look at the cyclical bull or bear markets or are you just like, no, no, once we retrace a certain amount, like we're in a bull market? Uh, yeah, I'm more along that that camp. I am also with you that series of higher highs and higher lows are the things that help kind of defend, de determine an uptrend. And I think you're right. I think we failed to make a new high a few months ago. And, uh, I mean, it's pretty clear at this point now that we're, what, uh, 500 points away, 400 plus points away from that high that we saw in July, that uh, a new high is not around the corner anytime soon. I think there's a lot of folks that thought, oh, a little pullback's healthy, and we could still end up with an end of year rally, and maybe we get to a new high. I think the probability of that looks lower and lower. At this point, I think we're still about 15% above the October lows. So I'm sure CNBC will come out with something. Every time the market's been up 25 or 20% off a low and then never made a new low, and this we'll get those sort of things going around. But yeah, I mean, so we're 10% down from the most recent high and we're 15% above the October lows. I don't know what to do with that yet, but. And, you know, I mean, we're, we're sort of, I guess the other thing too, Jay, is a lot, you and I keep saying, we'll keep saying this until people are tired of hearing it. In the end, it really co comes down a lot of times to earnings, to corporate earnings. And this market has, you know, the, the forward multiple and 
the forward estimates are estimates. They're not actuals. But the next 12 months, the consensus is about $240 a share on the S&P. Uh, if you take the the close today, which was, what was it, 4117 divided by 240, it's a little over 17 forward PE. That's not crazy. So if earnings stay up, and it seems like we've hit the the trough in earnings, I don't know. I mean, is is this, it's cheaper than it was, but what's the long run? Like 16 and a half PE over 25 years? Feels yeah, like so we're, we're you know you would argue we're kind of fairly priced against the average. Uh, I would probably argue with with interest rates where they are, which is the other piece that I always look at, and I know you know we both look at that. Um, it's probably it could be considered even a little expensive. I think a fundamental analyst, which I am not, would tell you it's pre- yeah, it's probably a little expensive. There might be other uh, alternative uses, you know, other choices. For, to get your returns that are uh, that take less risk. The other thing that's happening too is, so I, I saw this on Twitter. Let me see who created this. This is Bloomberg Bernstein Analysis. That's all I have, Jay. So apologies to whoever created this. And one of the things they did was they showed a, a scatter plot. And the scatter plot was, was this, since 2003. Okay. And in, in the y-axis is the S&P 12-month forward P.E., and the bottom axis is the nominal 10-year bond yield. And our audience can't see this, obviously, Jay, but what it says is the higher the 10-year yield goes, there is a correlation where forward PEs come down. I think that's kind of what you were alluding to there, higher interest rates, because you've got to discount those earnings back, right? Yeah, that's exactly it, right? Because, well, so you just went, you know, even into the math of why it matters, right? I was more of the investment choice of why it matters. But you're right. When you, when, look, you have an alternative, you know, we talked for years about there was, uh, you know, Tina, there is no alternative and you had to invest in stocks. So having a little premium in equities uh, made sense when you didn't get paid to hold the bond, right? But now uh, you do. Uh, have a, a you do get paid to 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 hold bonds. I think I looked at the the four month bond uh, right before we started this today. It was trading at like you know five point six, five point seven. Like it's it's there's a fairly decent uh, amount of return uh, over inflation when you uh, uh, when you buy a bond now and a treasury, I should say, with, that's considered to have I won't say no risk, very very little risk, the safest investment in the in the world. You're right, Derek. When 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 you you add in the whole, uh, you're better at this part than I am. But you add in the whole part of hey, like uh, you know, the the your your revenue is going to be a little different in those situations because of the the ten year bond. It's going to bring forward PE down a little bit. And the and this chart, how many data points do you think are on this chart here? Uh, it goes back how far? Is it twenty years of S and P yeah, data? Like I that. think. Yeah, and it is a pretty clear trend. That uh, as you get a higher bond, you get a lower forward PE in the S and P five hundred. Uh, the next twelve month forward PE. I mean, there's a little bit of I'll call it crowding out of investment right now because you're right. I mean, I think people, a lot of people, are putting cash into treasuries, but I, there may be people who are also saying, I could get. And by the way, I mean, you're right. There, there's really little to no risk. On treasuries, the the risk would be a default, or a risk would be that uh, we've got inflation, or the I mean, I, don't get me started on the deficit. But you know, the the purchasing power of the dollar goes down. That that's sort of the extraneous risk. But and I would say too that if anything happens to treasuries, something's going to happen to everything else too. So it's not like you'd be unsafe in treasuries and safer somewhere else. But at five and a half or six, <laughs> right, you know, right. it's you started to crowd out some some equities. Yep, yep, no doubt, no doubt. And so it just becomes a a choice. And you know, we we've and even despite all of that, Derek. Right, by the way, this is not a new situation. You and I have been talking about there is an alternative now to stocks for months, right? Uh, quarters even, and yet you have s- still seen a drop in the value of bonds, right? It's a little perplexing to me. At some point, that's probably got to unwind. 
but a little perplexing to me of uh, there's no flight to safety trade right now, right? Like if things get bumpy in the equity markets, they're also impacting fixed income. Uh, there's not that whole inverse correlation. They are much more correlated. And so it's almost like, you know, I think I saw the two year traded again over. Um, sorry. Yeah. Uh, sorry, dude. I'm, I'm, I think I saw the 10 year I meant to say trading at around 5% again. I'm not sure if it closed over that or not. But, you know, adding that to a portfolio, which is what everybody kind of compares that 60-40 portfolio to, should provide some value, but it is not, right? It's still costing you to be in that position. And so I I don't know, Derek, I think this is like we're still in the world of uh, bonds are a little backwards. I don't know how much longer that's going to last, but they are still a little backwards from traditionally how people think about it. I mean, if any thoughts on what's keeping them there? Some of this, I, I do think that the, the U.S. Treasury is issuing more bonds. The more supply, the, the less you know, de- supply gets a little imbalance with demand. But honestly, so if your hypothesis is that things are going to get really bad, are they going to get really bad because the 10-year goes to 7%? Or are they going to get really bad and at the same time rates are falling? Like that's... If, if you're buying a 10-year bond, you're basically saying, I'm okay getting you know, 5% annualized for the next 10 years if I hold it. But you're also saying that you think that rates are going lower. Like, Why are you buying that, I guess would be the question. Because let's say the Fed keeps rates here and the economy, we just had a GDP print of 4.9%, and GDP keeps growing and the economy keeps growing. If the Fed sticks where they are, the ter- the term premium or the you know the, the the extra you get paid for taking the risk of instead of buying a two year bond you go out to ten years, that should be higher. So if it goes to six or seven, like you're gonna you know your your principal is gonna lose money. So I don't know. I mean, I it, it's tough. It, it's taking any sort of duration, you are taking interest rate risk, and I just don't think people want to do that right now. I don't think people want it. They want it in January. Well, now that now that they're down, they don't want it anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the bond market's huge. I mean, you don't think we're th- those investors are drying up, do you? Right. I mean, like sometimes you get some exhaustion in the stock side of things. You think we're getting that exhaustion, and I think that goes back to the um, you know your supply point. I mean, do you, are we getting, are we having some exhaustion or people just, there's just not enough buyer? That's already started though. Do you remember though that who is not buying bonds? Here's a trivia question. Who is a big buyer of bonds that aren't buying bonds anymore? The Fed. Uh, the Asia? Fed. No, for, forget about Asia. The Fed. <laughs> the Fed. The Fed, the Fed, the Fed. <laughs> it's, I mean, they are letting their balance sheet run off and- they're letting their balance sheet run off, which means that as things uh, mature, they don't take those proceeds and reinvest them. They send it back to the treasury. Uh, they might be doing some things in the bond market to sort of adjust things. I mean, how much was the Fed buying before they stopped buying bonds? How much were they buying a month? Wasn't it like $100 billion a month, $120 billion a month? Yeah. Yeah, it's That's quite kind a bit. of big. Yep. That's a kind of a big deal. So. And it, that's also another question too. So you think about the order of things. Everyone's talk, just fixated on interest rates, but there's this other component that no one really talks about. And that is they're letting the balance sheet run off to a tune of, I forget how many you know, millions, billions a month. Their first step could be, hey, we're going to hold our balance sheet level, which means as things come and mature, they're going to go out and they're going to add more bonds to replace the ones that matured. And I think that's a, a very likely thing. They want to do some yield control where they're going to say, okay, 10 year or 20 years getting a little, the, the yield's going a little too high. We'll go out and we'll buy those. So I think that's more of a plausible thing. But Jay, to, to your original question, I mean, to me, it's like the most obvious answer. It's the Fed. Okay. It's the Fed. All right. Volatility, Jay. There's, so the market's retracing 10%. So how is the VIX only at? What did it close today? Twenty one twenty seven. Yeah, we're just not seeing that that fear 
being represented that you'd normally see in a, a sell-off like we have, right? We're in the third month in a row of declines. You're just not seeing, you know, any kind of spike in the volatility index and the VIX. And uh, yes, it has been marching upwards. That's true. Uh, I think I recall, well, I shouldn't say I think I recall. I know you and I uh, brought it up on a podcast uh, a few months ago and we said, look, you know, volatility's hanging around the 13 level. Like that actually, when we hit that 13 level, I'm taking a look at what the date was on that. You know, that was September 14th. Mm. So it was not that long ago, and we have been marching higher, but it has been fairly orderly higher and not spiky, meaning you haven't seen these big rushes to buy hedges or rushes to take speculation on a rebound. Um, so it's just been really a slow march. You know, you would have, you would think that uh, with what we've seen here on the correction front, that you would start to have a higher kind of risk premium in 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 uh in S&P options and we're just not so far. Right? It's a little curious. We have seen a little bit of movement in the VIX, which of course is the the options on the VIX, the volatility of the volatility. And I know we've been watching that for a while where that has risen more relative to how much the VIX has risen. So it's almost like the market saying in the options market, yeah, the VIX isn't really going up, but if you want to buy options on the VIX, you're going to pay up because it's almost like uh, a crouching, what's a crouching tiger, hidden dragon, a crouching, it's a, it's a coiled spring. That was a good right? one. Something like that. that it's not my one. best one. Yeah. I'm just, it's not my best work, Jay, but, uh, oh, you know. Okay. I thought you were preempting a, a recommendation. No, no, no recommendation. This reminds me a little bit, but not exactly of December of 18. And December of 18 Early December, the VIX was around 21. So we're uh, we're contracted about 10%. It wasn't until December 18, you started to get closer to Christmas Eve. And Christmas Eve, we actually had the big vol explosion up to 36. Oh, yeah. The, I remember that yep. week, right? Every day down 3% leading in, culminating on Christmas Eve. Yeah. So maybe it, maybe it's like December of 18, where we're, we just haven't corrected enough. There hasn't been that really bad minus 3% day. You know, these have been a little bit more orderly. And maybe that's what's reflected in the VIX, Jay. Yeah. I mean, they def- they, it, it has been fairly orderly. I, uh, again, I, you would think it'd start to have these flashes higher, right? But even intraday, right? We watch what's going on in the S&P when it's at the low of the day in the first hour or so. If that happened, then boom, no no pop in the VIX. Normally, you would see at least some movement there. I, I think to the, crouching, uh, to the crouching point, right, to the coiling of the spring, um, well, you're right that the VIX has not been going up nearly as fast as the VIX. That's kind of a sign to me that uh, it could be that, look, the hedgers have their positions on already, and they're fine with this movement, and uh, you know they may even be taking some of them off with a little bit of uh, profit that they have, and say long puts or even some of the you know VIX calls that they might have. What so? Why does that matter? I always think of that as you know, if the VIX is moving up faster than the VIX is moving up, you get that separation in the two of them. Uh, in the past, that has been kind of a reversal signal. We're not there yet, but there's. You know, it could move towards that. I mean, that we that could be the thing if we could just get a little capitulation and fear with the with the VIX and not see it in the VIX. You could get that capitulation signal, Derek, that we watch out for. I used to always my contrarian indicator. Remember, I called it the cupcake indicator, and that was, you know, you've hit a recent bottom and capitulation in the markets where it typically you see high volume. VIX blows out a little bit. High yield spreads may blow out, but the the market sort of bottoms and it's the cupcake indicator because then you see the morning shows, your local morning show when you turn it on and they've got a little like image, you know, picture in picture in the bottom right hand corner with a chart of the Dow Jones. And of course, this is local news. So they only show the Dow because, you know, that's what what you like. (laughs) Somebody in the back room, you know, they're, all right, we got Chef, uh, you know, uh, Enrico Palazzo on some people get that reference uh, coming on 
It's yeah, a good one. I like that. Another good movie. And, uh, yeah. you know, we with the markets fly. All right, let's let's put it. What do we look at? Dow Jones. Yeah, we, we put that on. Like, there hasn't been any of that. And I, and I don't. Yeah, like the Dow down a thousand points, right? Those, those, that just shows up, and a thousand points isn't what it used to be, obviously. But you're right. Oh, yeah, I like that you called the cupcake indicator. That's I might have stuff. had that in my book. I forget. If not, it'll be in the next one, Jay. Let's make a note of that. So, oh, your your book, which <laughs> is you know a great gift for this time of year, as we're changing the seasons, right? The broken pie chart. I think well, it's definitely wonderful. Check. Yeah, a broken uh, pie chart available on Amazon.com. Uh, my book also buy and. Uh, Hedge from uh, from UJ, another good book. I think if people, oh yes, yeah, thanks. if people order it, they could probably get it delivered over the weekend. And have it in time for uh, Halloween. I mean, what kid wouldn't love a two books like that put in their uh, their satchel? Um, so you just hand hand them out instead of candy. Yeah, that's, that's a good right. point. All right, Jay. Back to the volatility, though. Here's my other theory. I mean, what would you do if you were like 12 years old? Someone gave you a book. <laughs> As you trick or treat, do you do you remember when uh, in in New Jersey they would uh, you get changed sometimes? Like you go up to a door and somebody would give you like a quarter. You get pennies, yeah, pennies or yeah, quarter. Pennies or, oh, I don't know. My, my town was more poor than yours. I don't I know. I, I don't pennies. know. I, it might have been pennies. It might have been like you know a change jar. Here, <laughs> here you go. They could have just not answered the door. Like you know, people do that in Arizona. Like like in Arizona. If you don't want trick or treaters, typically people just don't turn on their lights and stuff. You know, they just. But it's Jay. It's crazy out here. That where I live, it's almost uh, like the streets are closed down, and it's just massive. All these kids and and people come here into my neighborhood from other parts of the uh, of you know Scottsdale, Phoenix, and everything. It's nuts. It's nuts. So yeah, it's definitely it's definitely changed. I, th- I think it's that way everywhere these all right, days. Back to back to the markets. So. There. Back to volatility. By the way, is is it an indicator? Um, if I if I was going trick or treating and you got the really big candy bars, is that an indication that the economy is really good? I don't know. Oh, absolutely! You got the big yeah. ones. Yes. I feel like you know, two thousand eight, two thousand nine, and you're getting out pennies. Here. Maybe you know, two thousand nineteen, you're getting <laughs> you know full full on uh, full size. All right, back to my theory. 2009, there's a lot of empty houses. That, that's that's just true. Sign. Back to the markets. Let me get yeah. here, Jay. My other theory is this is orderly because this is all rebalancing. And the reason why I say that is bonds keep going down. Okay, sell equities, buy more bonds. Bonds keep coming down, sell equities, buy more bonds. Like we've talked about this before, but in some ways, I feel like this rebalancing is is sort of feeding onto itself. I could be completely wrong. I have no data on this, but it's just in my mind. It it makes sense. So I'm just going to say it. And so what are you saying? You're saying the normal quarterly rebalance means, hey, because bonds are down, you have to allocate more to bonds, right? But stocks are down a little worse right now, no? Well, they are, but I guess not for the year. Though. No, not, for, not the year. for the year. Not for the year, especially if you had. Think about target date funds. I mean, if you had some duration in target date I funds, I really try not. I to. know, I know. I really not try not to think about those <laughs> things. <laughs> Terrible. Sorry for those of you who invested in your four hundred one k because you thought it was a smart. I have thing a whole to do. chapter uh, that's titled "Target Date Surprise" in my book. People should read up on uh, my my feelings on target date funds. I don't know. It's, I just think it like normally bonds would be up or hold steady and stocks would be down. So you'd sell bonds to buy more stocks, but it's the opposite right now. Bonds are down more than stocks in like in the 60 40 portfolio, maybe until recently. So maybe it has caught up with itself now. I don't know. Um, Last thing on vol, well, volatility. Let's talk about earnings a little bit. I know you were watching Amazon this week and, we talked last week about, you know, kind of a dangerous trade around earnings. People saying, I know it's going to move. I'm going to buy the call, buy the put. But right before earnings is the most expensive time. What did you see on the implied volatility on Amazon? Amazon had a pretty good report and jumped up. But what was it? Did it get crushed? 
Yeah, it sure it sure did. And and it's so Amazon, when you look at volatility over the past year, right, this to me is at or lower than the previous three quarters when you look how expensive options were going going into earnings. And typically, you know, you'd think that was a little bit of a bullish signal, and that seemed to be the way it played out today, last night with Amazon, but uh not the case for all tickers, right? I mean, it's, but volatility in general has been kind of, again, there's this weirdness where despite the market uh, showing some signs of weakness, the volatility around earnings has also been coming down. And it's a little bit of, it's, it's almost tempting you to get long, you know, uh, volatility or getting long options going into earnings. But again, you need pretty dramatic moves to get those. Uh, to to make that pay off for you, I don't know, Derek. It, it's again. It seems like, gosh, I hate to use this word. It seems a little like a sucker bet. I still prefer to be selling premium uh, around earnings versus buying it, even though it's still kind of you know trending a little lower. Uh, you know, and so as a, as a reference, what am I talking about? So when I when I look at where volatility is on Amazon, just going into earnings, it was around you know around fifty. Last quarter was around 55, the quarter before that around 60, the quarter before that around 70. So that's the downtrend that I'm seeing in the in the implied volatility of the options. Uh, but uh, still, I, I still prefer usually default to be a seller of options, which then takes advantage of a decline in volatility right after the earnings come out. So that's kind of my take on this. And it's not just Amazon, but Amazon's a nice story because it's up. Right. Same thing happened with uh, Microsoft. And I don't want to get off Amazon unless you want to, you know, in case you have anything you want to add. No, I mean, I'm, Meta, I saw the same thing. Meta was a, a crush in volatility right after Meta got killed. Uh, Microsoft's earnings were good. But yeah, I mean, Microsoft and the, you know what, though? Microsoft is interesting because it, it didn't it moved the day after. And I'm not sure that the, the volatility was that high. I mean, I think it was only what? little above 30, 30%. And you should probably explain what a 30% volatility really is when we say that, what that, what that means. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So that, so volatility is uh, a component of the option price uh, that kind of pushes the, the price higher based off of, I like to say, it's like the only, one of the only emotional uh, data points within the market that you could track. So it just tells you, you know, how much more someone's willing to pay for an option uh, compared to other times, even though the underlying stock price might be the same. And when you have a volatility of 30 or 32, kind of that range, and I think Derek picked that number because it's it's one of those numbers that we like. It's a nice round number. It means that you have an expectation that uh, the stock will move about 2% that day, right? So the one standard deviation is a 2%. So it means 67% of the time, you should around 66, 65% of the time, you should expect the market to move um, uh, within 2%. And that's fairly wide, right? Stocks typically don't move 2% in a single day. Certainly equity markets in general don't move that. Um, and so that's kind of what it tells you, right? The higher that volatility number means the wider set of uh, returns you can have. So it means having a plus 5 or 6% move is fairly unlikely. Now, Microsoft did have a nice move, Derek, after earnings, it actually three days later is below, it's trading below uh, where it was uh, before it announced. So even though you got a little pop on it as it went to, uh, let's see, went from, you know, 330 up to 345 uh, in price, uh, you know, you still, now it's it's below 330. Uh, I think it's another one. You're right, Derek. It wasn't predicting all that much movement. And so uh, my gut tells me if you were actually long options going into that one, you probably got paid on the day of. Uh, but uh, now, you know, at expiration Friday, uh, you uh, you still you probably lost if you were long options. The other point I'll bring up about about Microsoft, it is um, while the volatility, the implied volatility was lower for this quarter, it's about the same as it was two quarters ago. So it's it has not had that declining volatility um, that some of the other tickers that we mentioned, like Amazon and Meta, have. Yeah, it's like that's a case where if you bought the straddle, 
if you got out of it the very next morning, you you probably made money. If you sold it, you lost money. Yeah, yeah. you, you got to take it, or, or you got to leg into you know spreads by selling right. some options against it to lock in some gains. Yeah. yeah. So we're we're through. Speaking of of so we're we're through Amazon. Who's left of the Magnificent Seven? Magnificent Seven, by the way, is what we're coining, quote unquote. It's Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Nvidia, Tesla, and Meta. If I have those right. So who? Meta's gone. I Tesla's think, gone. Think right. You got it. Amazon, Google, Microsoft. So what is it? Apple and Nvidia's are the two left, correct? Apple and Nvidia. Okay. Yep. Yep. They. They. I think there's a lot of hope. I think Apple is drumroll, please. I think it's the second. Yep, the second of November in the afternoon. So this will definitely be out by then. That is. Um, that's Thursday. So. Yeah. The, by the way, that has had. Uh, I will say this about Apple implied volatility. It's not like the others that really starts to peak out around earnings. It has been on a move higher as the stock has been coming down, which is not unusual. Uh, but it hasn't really spiked, right? When I'm looking at last quarter, uh, it was at 35. The quarter before that, it was at around the same number, maybe 36. And then before that, it was in the 40s. Right now, we're hovering. I'm looking at where volatility close today. It's 31. So with earnings just, you know, Four trading days away, interesting that that hasn't popped in volatility. Maybe we'll get that spike coming uh, coming into it the day or two before. NVIDIA is not till, I think, the 21st. Is that the week of Thanksgiving? They don't re- it's always a late yeah. one. Let me take a look. Yeah, I think that's, yep, that's late. Oh, yep. uh, yeah. Okay. You, uh, the 21st, I added. That's what, okay, that's why I thought. Yeah. Thing. 21st, Tuesday, yeah. Now, that has had a pop in volatility already, and I think it's based off of some of the other earnings uh, that have come out uh, and some other discussions. But, yep, that has already had its kind of pop. But, again, it's a series of lower volatility. So NVIDIA uh, trading at about a – is that a 60 volatility right now, Derek? Yeah, that's what I see, about a 60. So that's high. Like that's – you know, using my rule of 32, if two is to, that means it's a, you expect a 4% move any day at this point in a video. And we've got a ways to go before earnings. So market definitely putting a, a premium on movement with NVIDIA if you want to get long options. I'm going to go on a, my soapbox for a second, my rant. I'm tired of people showing the equal weight S&P index minus the Magnificent 7. The reason you buy an index is because it has all the stocks. And there should be some, I mean, I, I've seen the charts. Oh, if you take out the Magnificent Seven, the biggest companies in the world, it's the equal weight is sort of flat or down for the year. And those stocks are too much weight in the S&P 500. And those stocks are driving all the returns. That's why you buy the index. Like, stop worrying about that. And yes, if those companies do really bad, it's going to be a rough time for the index. But I just, I, I think it's, it's not healthy to keep saying, you know, oh, the index, you know, now we're going to look at the equal weight. You could have bought that 10 years ago. You didn't. So I don't know. I'm, I'll keep it short, Jay. Well, that, that, yes, I understand your frustration because it's a kind of a shoulda, coulda, woulda. But I do like that it helps illustrate the broad participation of the market, right? If you were a follower of that, you'd recognize that, hey, 493 stocks are actually down for the year. This is a continuation of a lower movement. Oh, but because there's seven, you're you're up, which by the way, is absolutely a case why you should be using the index and the weighted index, right? You should be using those 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 tools as as designed. Uh, but I think it's maybe more of a, you know, I think it's an interesting talking point to help people understand, uh, you know, broader stock performance. And, you know, unless you picked one of those, if you're going to be a stock picker, unless you pick those, you know, one of those seven, you're probably down for the year. Right. So it, it I think it just goes more to the disposition of how everybody's feeling and, and uh, about, you know, the markets in general. But that's it. That's that's the way I interpret it. I don't get annoyed like it it rubs you, 
the wrong way. I just, it, well, it's kind of like, you know, it, it, it's, it's why you buy the index. Like this is the value of indexing. And we like, I mean, one of our core strategies, buy and hedge. We buy the index, we buy the S&P and we hedge it with our buffered index growth. We're, we're buying the S&P and then it's, it's buffered, you know, different, different mechanics there. But it's, it's this thing of rather than try and pick stocks, like what would be the play? Would somebody have said, well, I'm going to short the Magnificent Seven and buy the equal weight or short the S&P and buy the equal weight? I mean, that's, that's just a different trade. I don't think you can take those companies out. Yeah, it's a pairs trade, yeah. right? That's, that's isolating. There's other ways to trade that, right? You can isolate with different indexes. Although they have now kind of split all those up. They used to put all those mm-hmm. in tech, right? Now they're in communication and discretionary. Yeah. I think there are, I think there is a magnificent seven ETF out there. Well, there will be if there's not, I mean, it's, somebody will put that out just like the AI one, right? Remember AI came out and it was like, okay, you could buy NVIDIA or you could buy NVIDIA at 50% of the index and a bunch of other stuff. But yeah, I think chat is, uh, is, is one of those ETFs. Oh, is it chat? Oh, probably. That's a that's a great ticker. Good for them. Good for them for getting that. Nice work. Yeah, yeah. We know we know those uh, guys. Oh yeah. Okay, I just saw that. Yes, we do. We do. We do. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So I think we're good on on that. The other thing I wanted to talk about is the Fed puts out a I think it's a triannual survey. And what, what the survey does, it's the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. If you go to their, I'll put a link to it in the show notes. But they, they survey households and the data is out. And what they found was that median net worth rose. I think I hinted at it last, uh, last time we were podcasting. We were on the broadcast. So okay. it's, yeah. it's, uh, there's good news. And I think it's, it's up even above inflation and what you see is that the median net worth, so let me just give you some numbers. If you want it to be in the top 10% of households, and this is median. So for anyone out there who's like median, mean, all that stuff, ah, oh, stats class, I don't even want to think about that. If you, the way I always explain it is like if you went into a room and there's 10 people and one person has a net worth of a million dollars. And the nine other people have a net worth of a penny. Well, the average is going to be basically a hundred thousand. So you're like, oh, cool. Everyone, oh, the the, the average net worth is a hundred thousand. Oh, that's pretty good. But really, it's just driven by that one person. So if you did median, you would sort of toss out that person. You toss out if there were you know much lower, and it's the median is the middle. So the net worth there, the median net worth would be like a penny. So the average would be a hundred thousand, the, the median a penny. If I'm doing that right, I think I am. So you I know that I, right. I know. Yeah. So you got so the median. <laughs> you are the professor. Um, you need one point four six seven point eight million dollars to be in the top ten percent, according to the median uh, amounts by the the Fed survey. So, and that was up. That was up from a couple of years ago. The, the bottom 25% is basically 11,000. So if you're in the, the bottom 25% of, which means you have 75% of people have more money than, than your household if you're in the bottom 25. 75 to, to let's say 89.9 is about 498,000 is the median net worth. And that includes homes, that includes non-financial assets. It's, it's all in, it's everything. So... I think there's a couple of points here. One is that it takes less than you think to get into the top top 50%. You have to have 250,000 net worth. Uh, to get into the top 25%, you have to have, you know, about 500,000 and top 10% about 1.46 million, but, you know, above there. It takes less to get into those percentiles than people think. Also, I didn't bring it up on this one, but uh, so what's, what's the Swiss bank? Credit Suisse. Credit Suisse. Uh, or they were. Yeah. Well, the, they were. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they did a worldwide one of these too. And then if you say, I know you can't be like, oh, well, if you had 500,000, according to the world, you'd be much, much higher. 
<clears throat> but uh, what I want to focus on, Jay, is uh, I think it was – who put this out on Twitter? I'll, I'll get it in a second. They broke down the age range and the median net worth by age. And I want to focus on – and I, I know you want to focus on another end of this. But 20 to 24-year-olds, median net worth 10 point, uh, or 10, 10.8, 10,800 dollars, 25 to 29, 30,000, 30 to 34, 89,801. Okay. You would expect that because uh, the younger people are, the less number of prime working years they are, uh, the less amount of contributions they've been able to, to do. And the reason I wanted, wanted to bring this up is I think if you look at and if you talk to a lot of younger people, they are very fixated on what to buy, trying to maybe trade the market, trying to say, you know, should I, should I buy this stock, but I buy that stock. If your median net worth is, is let's say $10,000, and all you do is make a contribution of $1,000, you've risen your net worth by 10%. And the point I'm making here is that people who are younger should be focused on saving and contributing. And it's, it's sort of, it's not that it doesn't matter, but later uh, it, it matters more about the compounding. So that's kind of one of the points. And I, and I think a lot of young people sort of measure themselves maybe against that, that 1.4, like, oh, how could I get into the top 10%? Oh, I only have $10,000. They're looking at it the wrong way. Like just focus on contributions. It's, it's going to work over time. It, it's sort of quote unquote, always does. I can't say always, I just did. Jay, any thoughts on on some of these numbers? Yeah, yeah. So I agree. It's you know you say save and then contribute. That contribute is synonymous with right. invest, right? Save, save up, and put it in and pay yourself. That's the way I like to talk about it. And uh, yeah, put it to work. Where you're absolutely right because you have so much time. If you're in that twenty to twenty four or twenty five to twenty nine range, time is your friend. You just got to get it to work. Uh, it's a, a it, it's a point that I make with any anybody who's on the younger end and and like going okay Jay what stock should I pick and I said don't right <laughs> use an index uh, yeah but just continue to pay yourself I think that's really really important uh, uh, to, to to talk about that the other thing that I would add you're right I wanted to take a look at the, the upper end of this not because I'm in my 60s or anything like that. Um, but I told somebody the other day, I was 53. They couldn't believe it. I said, it's because I got a fat face. I look younger. He said, it's because I have new mm. hair. Derek, I know that's not your, your excuse. Um, <laughs> besides that, uh, you know, it's interesting when you look at the average net worth, it kind of, the older the person is, the higher that number goes until you get to like the 65, 70 range. And it really kind of peaks out. So uh, that peaks out where the average net worth is 1.8 uh, million, right? That's the average net worth. Again, you're hold the average mean, so we know that that gets skewed. Uh, and then it actually starts to decline. So uh, 55 to 60, it's 1.4. 60 to 64, it's 1.6. 65 to 69, it's 1.8. And then 70 to 74, it drops down to 1.7. 75 to 80, it drops down to 1.6. But the median kind of continues to go up. So I, you know, it's just a little interesting weirdness in the numbers there. Uh, but Derek, I think uh, this, it still makes sense, right? It's still, when you think about the investors that we talk to, you know, in that 55 and up range, they're the ones that uh, really do have more money to invest. And quite frankly, they're the ones where all of a sudden it actually makes sense to talk to an advisor like us, right? Just buying the index at 55 or 60 may not be the right choice for you because uh, you're probably approaching retirement, right? And there's no riskier time in your investing life than the day you retire. It's not when you're 80, right? If, if you're going to make it, you already got enough money. If you're going to run out, you already ran out, right? It's that time um, when you retire, that's the riskiest time. And so, you know, not that it doesn't always help to have different investment choices while you're younger, while you're in your 40s. Um, but as you get closer to those age ranges of retirement, it really does start to make sense to select strategies that can, you know, help you through, uh, you know, potentially the hardest time uh, that you've invested. You know, folks that turned 65 last year or retired last year, if they hadn't, 
you know, reduce the risk or plan for it appropriately, they're probably finding themselves scratching their head a little bit right now. You know, like if you if you retired in January of 2022 or December of 2021, right, where markets were at their highest today, fast forward uh, to basically November of 2023 and the market hasn't really paid you that much back. Uh, if you hadn't planned for that, you know, I'm sure that uh, you have you're considering different plans. Right. So it's again, it's around that time where it gets really hard. Derek, when you and I really first got into this business, right, in the early 2000s, I know you're a little sooner than I was, but, you know, you think about that lost decade between 2000 and 2010. If you re- if you retired in February of 2000, uh, you just had a, you know, a lost decade uh, that was the top of the dot-com bubble. Uh, you just had a lost decade through the through 2010. So, you know, it's one of those things that uh, I'm not saying that's what we're going to have here, but it's why it matters when you have built up your assets so much to have someone to talk to about managing risk, especially as you're approaching retirement. I'll take it a, a different way too, Jay. My first full year in the market was 94. And I remember 1987, Black Monday, October crash was still fresh. It was fresh enough and painful enough that people stayed out of the markets, stayed in cash, maybe just didn't, didn't want to take any risk. And one of the greatest bull markets we've seen started 82, 87 was a mere blip, 98 had a little bit of trouble, but really it didn't end until March of 2000. And 94 to March of 2000 was an unbelievable run. And it just, sometimes there's this 10 years before people retire. And if you have a million dollars, you get 7.2% annualized, you're going to wind up with $2 million. You brought up the lost decade. If all you had was equities and you didn't go from a million to two million, you were flat. You were basically flat. And then imagine, you know, you had really bad timing. So it's sort of the value of there are different points in an investor's life cycle. And sometimes hedging lets them stay invested when when they wouldn't otherwise. But also to your point, Jay, like the most dangerous time is when somebody retires and they, they can't take a big hit then. They can't make it back. They're, they don't have 10 more years of prime working years to add to it. So, yeah. Yeah, they're drawing down. That's right. They're drawing down. That's yep. right. They're drawing down. And now we have, you know, with inflation and everything, but all right, we'll leave that for another time. I am going to link uh, to this. And if you're somebody who likes data, it's like the Fed puts, there's a spreadsheet you can download. And I, I don't even know how many tabs there are. You love Excel, Jay. I, I feel like there's like 60 tabs. So you can go in there and a lot of, a lot tabs. of tabs. It's good stuff. I, don't, I wonder how many households it is, though, <laughs> like what the standard error on this is. You know, it, I, I don't, they're not talking to all households, but they sort of extrapolate the data. So, um, okay. I guess we, do we talk about high yield spreads? We did not. You want to hit on that real quick? Yeah. So high yield spread, which is the spread between the yield on high yield and U.S. Treasuries, despite this correction, it is not, quote unquote, you know, widening. I don't know why I put quotes on that. It's not widening. It's not, you know, it's not crazy. And typically what you see is when markets sell off and there's a lot of fear, when the VIX goes up a lot, you tend to see high yield spreads expand, meaning People are selling high yield. And when bonds price goes down, yield goes up. Jay, the last, uh, it's about four and a half, which is sort of in no man's land. It's just, it's not, you know, I mean, treasury yields haven't, I mean, they've come up, but the demand for more yield on, on high yield hasn't happened yet. I don't know what this means relative. Maybe it pairs with the VIX well, what you were saying earlier. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, that's true, right? This you you would assume this would be a little worse. So maybe just for those that don't, I know you've you've I'm sure you've educated multiple times on on spreads. The concept here is when you sell a bond, like a high yield bond, if everybody sold their bonds, then bonds down, yields up, right? So the yield on high yield would rise faster than say the yield on a treasury. That would be an indication that there's fear in the market or concerns that high yield will underperform. So they're selling the more risky assets uh, and they're buying the safer asset, which would be the treasury, right? They're making that, that 
you know, flight to safety trade. And as I mentioned before, that hasn't really happened in the Treasury side of things. And I think that's one of the things that's keeping the spread a little muted. As a reference, uh, during 2020, those spreads got to 11% difference, 11 a hundred basis point difference, just about. And right now we're talking about, what'd you say, about a four? Yeah, it's about a four, four and a half. just over four, yeah. hovering between four and five, right? So I'm not saying anybody should be feeling the fear of uh, the pandemic, but I am saying that, you know, when you see those uh, those those spread spike, it, uh, it definitely is indicative of fear in the market. Uh, take a look at, say, after June of 2022, right, when the market was really, when inflation was at its highest, I mean, spreads got up to 6%. Right? So again, not a lot of fear in that number either. Uh, but you do see these things from time to time pop up, but we're not seeing it now, right? So the difference between the yield of high yield and treasuries has been range bound, uh, again, not indicating that there's any flight to safety or risk off trades going on. Yep, I think that's I think that's right. And well, we'll save it for the next podcast. Like, there's some interesting interesting things to look at with high yield, and we use high yield in our short duration, very short duration high yield. We use senior loans, we use uh, high yield bonds in our buffered index growth as a way to to take that. Uh, those monthly distributions, uh, interest, dividend payouts, and then use that to fund long market exposure. But yeah, I mean, it's, I, I don't have the numbers. Uh, um, maybe I'll, I'll reach out to, uh, uh, to our friends over at State Street. But I feel like where the starting yield is, uh, that might be interesting to look at. You know, what, what's the returns five, 10 years later when yields have been this high or the spread is versus the spread of only, you know, four and a half. I don't know. I'm thinking out loud, Jay, more to come on that, but. Well, they, they have quite a bit of knowledge about uh, the history of high yield and they've, uh, we, we usually reference uh, what they tell us. So they're pretty smart about they that are. stuff. All right, Jay, also smart stuff. I, an update on the, the morning show for me. I'm in season two. I got to be honest with you. I, I might have to drop it from a hold. It's it's precarious. It's on negative negative uh, watch right now, negative rate watch, negative rating watch, <laughs> right. like a bond. I don't know. You're telling me it's going to get better. You, you you're thinking about that? You thinking about downgrading it? If listen, if you're in the middle of season two and and you're not smitten with it, then it's not going to get you. Might be early season two. I don't know. I don't know. I'm I'm. It's on negative right. rate watch. But as I think about what else. Any, anything you've been, uh, you were just on a plane, right? You probably watched something. I know you didn't watch Philly sports when you were there. Uh, yeah, yeah, tri- uh, yes. Uh, so uh, I watched, uh, I've been watching the new Marvel show Loki. It's the second season for that. So I am a Marvel guy. I think you know that. Uh, I have been watching that. So I think three episodes have been out so far. So I'm in the middle of doing that one. That's pretty good, especially if you're into the timey wimey travel stuff. If you're a Doctor Who fan, you know what that's from reference to. I don't. I never got into all the superhero movies. I think I remember seeing, was it, it Endgame? Was that one of the big ones? When I took my son. <laughs> yes. And then, I don't, I'm not, hopefully I won't ruin this. It's, it's an older movie at this point. Michael Douglas comes in on the end. I'm like, what was, what was Michael Douglas doing in here? Like, that's random to get him to show in a cameo. And then you explained to me, he was in like, he carried like two other movies all by himself. So yeah, he carried the Atmia movies. Yes, yes. Yeah, so, I was like, yes. Anyway, so I'm watching. I'm watching that one right now. Uh, the other one I was watching on Amazon, which is a little more of uh, kind of like uh, you know magic wizards and dragons kind of a thing, is the 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 wheel. I think it's the wheel on Prime. I think that's the name of it. Now I got to look it up, but I've, it's in the second season of that one too. So I think I'm pretty much through that. So that's it. So I'm into the you know. Nonfiction stuff. Sorry, fiction stuff right now, not the nonfiction. We're going to see a slew, I'm sure, of the SBF Sam Bankman Fried documentary soon, right? You, you got to believe that. He's testifying today. I, I mean, I have not been following the trial, but I love how everybody's pointing fingers. It's not surprising, but, you know, look, this guy was, was oh, you know, 
it's just a bad story there, like a bad apple, right? Like just thought he was bulletproof, right? And things blew up on him. It's a perfect example of how the market can, can be irrational longer than you can stay solvent. And uh, being on the wrong side of a bet too long and double downing on it is not always brave. Well, it could be brave, but it definitely could be stupid. I, too. I'd be interested. So if I was on that jury, I'd be fascinated to know if they, because it's not televised because it's federal court, I think. Federal doesn't get televised. But I would love to know, like, how did they lose the money? Like, what were the trades that we're doing? Like, that stuff really interests me. It's kind of like, we re- we still don't really know what Madoff did. And, I mean, we we know, they, but at what point it went from a Ponzi to, to not a Ponzi, you know, a, a real investments. But you look at uh, the Barings Bank, we know about that trade, how I think it was the Nikkei uh, Japanese futures went wrong and they kept, you know, like, I, I'd just be curious, what bet did they make that was, that was really bad? I don't know. It interests interest me. They bet on their own crypto. Yeah, I mean, that was it. And then there were no more buyers. They had nobody left to sell it to. Yeah, and they just, they were, now there were more sellers than buyers there. It was a, and then it was leverage, right, on it. Oh, of course. It was, it's always leverage. It's always leverage. I just, it's always leverage. I mean, maybe the rules in, in a crypto exchange are different, but my understanding, I, I say this, I'm sort of couching it, but like Schwab has on their page, they're required to, to, hold customer assets sort of in their own, you know, they can't commingle assets. It's right in there, I believe, in Schwab's terms and conditions. They segment segmentation of uh, of those. Of I course. mean, it's like they're not using my money to go trade, uh, you know, leverage crypto or something like that. It's it's segmented. So I... Yeah, but that's, that is ultimately what he did, right? Sounds he, like it. He took client money, yeah, and traded it elsewhere and it and lost it. I just, I really want to see, and I'm not through uh, Zeke Fox's book yet. Uh, I'll have a full report on that. It's I'm enjoying it so far, but I just, I'd like to know more about that. Did you see the story too, that I guess he was he working for um, Jane Street at one point. And I guess he had come out with um, some sort of an algorithm when he was working there to predict the election before anybody else, like where it would go. And I, Based upon that, I think, you know, it was the idea, okay, if, if Trump won versus Hillary won, the market would go one way or another. But I, I, I didn't know he was at, at Jane Street. So um, anyway, interesting. I didn't realize it either. We're, we're, we, we do a lot of business with Jane Street. So no bashing of Jane Street here, guys, if you're listening. No, no. I just, I, I saw a quick thing. I, I don't even know what the trade was. But, um, but yeah, it was apparently he... I, I guess he had worked for firms at one point and he was doing some of that stuff. So I just, I want to see a real documentary come out and know exactly what happened there because I don't feel fulfilled yet, Jay, that I know the whole story. That's all I'm saying. And I, and I'm very disappointed in the 60 minutes piece that they did on him a couple weeks ago. So, all right, that's it, Jay. I think we're good. Have we upset? We, right. we made a list. We met, we mentioned a lot of people. We uh, we probably should go before we start mentioning more people. But <laughs> sounds good, right, Derek. Jared, that's uh, I think it's going to be an interesting couple weeks in the market, though, and we'll see if there's going to be a year in rally. We'll see if VIX actually gets a little bit higher, market capitulates, or you know, you never know. That's what makes the market. All right, Jay. Thanks again. Bye.